first from the Old Testament, Numbers and 21. Numbers chapter 21. So still in that, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, Numbers is the story of two generations. That first generation that leaves um, Egypt under the um, leadership of Moses, the um, devastation of the plagues is behind and this generation sets off. Um, it, um, <clears throat> it is a failing generation, uh, rebellion all the way through and the people are numbered. And then um, chapter 26 around there, there's a second numbering of the people, it's a second generation. And it's this generation, there's something different about them. And they're the generation that will actually head and travel into the promised land. And in this particular chapter, uh, we're reaching now the end uh, of that first generation's existence. Um, you'll notice, verse 3, that they uh, defeat the armies um, at this place called Homer. And um, it is the place where previously... Um, they had done battle um, and they had um, been defeated so there's something different here uh, now they're looking to the Lord and trusting him they're praying what shall we do <clears throat> and they devote the, everything to the Lord um, it's almost like a first fruits offering and so here they are then the, this final throes of this last generation but though things are uh, different so much is still the same with some of these these folk, and we see the the problem with the serpent. Now, when they when we see that they head towards the Red Sea, um, they're wandering in the wilderness, but they're they're under the direction of the Lord God, and we can understand to some extent um, their concern here. Look, we've been wandering for forty years. When we first started off, we crossed the Red Sea. Where are we, le where are we, being, where are we going now? Well, we're going back to the Red Sea. 40 years and we're going back to the Red Sea. So you can understand something that is uh, of, of the concern of the people. Uh, and sometimes it seems to us we, we go through an experience. Uh, it may be pleasant, it may, be, may not be pleasant. And then years later, we, we're going through the same thing again. Um, and is the Lord just leading us round in circles or are we actually heading to the promised land at all so you see the, the, the parallels and you see the temptations of these people of course uh, they should have trusted the Lord doesn't he knows best um, he, he knows where they are he knows where they're heading he knows how to get them safely into the promised land and so their failure at this point failure of some of them uh, led to this um, uh, terrible uh, um, judgment uh, put upon them where they were bitten by these fiery serpents, snakes of some sort. Um, when we read that they were fiery, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were belching smoke uh, and, and flame. Um, they may have been, no idea. Um, but it may well just be that that once bitten, the, the, the result was that it was a fiery experience, that your flesh was burning up inside, fiery. There we go. Um, you, can, you can speculate on that one and decide what you think yourselves. Let's just read um, these um, uh, opening uh, uh, verses, and then uh, I'll read down to, to verse 9. When the Canaanites, the king of Arad, who dwelt in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by way of the Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed give this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. So the name of the place was called Hormah. From Mount Hor, they set out by way of to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. 
and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away from us the serpents. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, second reading um, this morning, and uh, we're going over into John chapter 3. John's Gospel and to chapter 3. We'll pick up the reading at verse 1, and you'll know the connection, of course. John's Gospel then, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to, to, to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher in Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I want to begin by telling you a little story. It happened some years ago to us as a family. Um, we decided to have a day out, and uh, we took my mum and my dad with the children and we went to the Blue Planet Aquarium. Uh, you may know where that is, it's a delightful place. Um, it was quite a miserable day, probably February, January, February, something like that. And the place was almost empty, this vast area uh, given over to sea life and fishes and, and skate and all the rest of it. And um, it meant that um, we were almost on our own as we travelled around this various place. And uh, everywhere we went, um, the attendant was keen to tell us all about their particular charge, uh, that this particular fish does this, this. It was very informative and, and quite wonderful. And uh, as we, we wandered from one place to another, uh, mum, my mum was alongside of me, and suddenly she said, Is that real? And I looked, and she was staring fixed straight ahead. And along the corridor on one side um, was a... Uh, it was a snake, and it was on a on a on a, a pole basically. It was like a like a bird table, 
this enormous thing, very beautiful, coloured, all the thing of it. Mum was not pleased. So I don't know if it, I'm sh it, yes, it's real, Mum, they wouldn't have a stuffed one. It's, a, it's real, but I'm sure it's safe. So I don't know, my, hold, we'll hold hands. Uh, and um, suddenly I found that she wasn't walking alongside me, but was slightly behind. And the nearer we got to this snake, um, which wasn't moving, it was t motionless, as they often are, um, uh, the tighter mum's grip got on my hand and, and I, I didn't look but I, by the time we got level with the snake I knew all my fingers were blue um, and, and as soon as we got level with this, she was in front of me and the way we went shouldn't be allowed she said shouldn't be allowed mum um, did not like snakes and I'm sure she's not alone in that it, we have some, some aversion uh, to snakes don't we we have this aversion to snakes uh, and um, we, um, we, we we just don't like them and uh, the snakes has a the snake has a um, uh, a, a bad uh, reputation through the scriptures just bear with me a moment um, uh, the, 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 there's a, a bad reputation through the scriptures the um, we, we meet the the serpent the snake first of all in Genesis chapter 3 and uh, the snake makes several appearances doesn't it um, the, 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 the magicians in Egypt have snakes they carry them around strange um, the, um, the snake is regarded as, as being the, the voice of the wicked speaker in the book of in the book of Psalms, um, the the wicked person is bitten as a reward um, for uh, or judgment because of or, or, uh, by the snake. Um, the we, we we have seen, haven't we, in um, in our reading in Numbers, the, the the judgment that came upon the people. They were bitten by these fiery serpents, these snakes of whatever sort that they were. Um, and then in the New Testament, our Lord's teaching, isn't it? Um, what wicked par parent would give a gift of a snake to a, child, to a child who is asking for something good? And then in the end we find that there is this, um, this terrible battle, this conflict that's going on in the heavenly places. And Satan in the end, that, that serpent is finally and fully destroyed. Uh, and there we have... Uh, that picture then in, in the scriptures of the snake. Um, we don't like them. We shouldn't like them. Um, people, some people do. That's it's not normal, frankly. It is, it's not normal to like them. It isn't normal. And here we are then in this, um, in this passage in the Old Testament in Numbers 21. So uh, that, that incident with our family was a few years ago. We're now going back 3,400 years into the, into the desert, into the wilderness. And here are these people. And they have been um, found guilty. They are under judgment. And the Lord sends upon them this, these, these fiery serpents. And everyone who is bitten dies. And they come to Moses and say, we have, we, we are, we have sinned. We have sinned. Uh, pray for us. And the Lord pray, uh, Moses prays to the Lord. And the Lord instructs him to, uh, to make an image of the snakes and to put it on a pole. Now, the camp of Israel... Um, it would always uh, encamp around the, the, the tabernacle. Um, the, there were tribes on every side, and then the Levites around the tribes, around the temple itself, the tabernacle itself, um, protecting the, the, the tabernacle from the tribes. And so the, 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 the camp is, is an enormous place. Probably two million people are camped around the tabernacle, two million and so if someone is bitten you've got to make the effort you've got to go and see and look at this serpent you've got to believe that it will work you've got to believe that if you're bitten that, that you'll go and see and look and it will work and you'll be saved it, 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 it's a life for a look at the serpent 
And the serpent is a foul and horrible and ugly and unclean thing. And it's, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. You, you, you are stuck, as it were, in this situation. And uh, there we are, the, the, the people have to look. Those who, bit, who are bitten, they will die. There is no remedy. But there is a heavenly remedy given by looking at the serpent, looking at the snake. The holy place has been defiled uh, and, and here are these unclean creatures and they have come in and they are biting the people. And Moses is commanded then to put this snake upon this pole, to hang it on the top of a pole and everyone who's dying can look and live. It's so simple. It is so simple. Were these people dying? Were they sinners condemned? Yes. Were they perishing under the wrath and judgment of the Lord God? Yes. Were they able to save themselves? No. Was it only by, by looking and believing at the serpent that is lifted up that they would be saved? Yes. And so that's what happened. We're not told specifically, but I'm guessing that there will be some who just wouldn't believe and wouldn't look. Isn't that amazing? All around them there are people who are being bitten, people who are looking and are being cured, and there are others who just will not do it. They would prefer to die in their sin. And this is the situation that we find ourselves in today. There are people out there, they would prefer not to listen, not to look. They would prefer, to, they, they love their sin, they, they will not turn away from it. And that is a tragedy for them. But then we move into John chapter 3, so 3,400 years ago, we're now 2,000 years ago, and here is this man Nicodemus. And he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Nicodemus, an interesting man, he's a leader of the Jews. He believes that by his own goodness and keeping the certain rules, he will be, he will be accepted eventually into the kingdom of God, that he will be fit for the kingdom of God. He's a law man. He believes that by his own goodness he can keep the law of God and so he will be fit to enter the kingdom of God. And then Jesus comes along and he's saying something radically different. Jesus is actually saying, it's not about law keeping but by believing in me. And the conflict with, with Nicodemus is that he can see that Jesus is able to do these signs. And so he goes to, to this, this man, Jesus, and he goes at night. Why does he go at night? Well, some people say, well, it was because he was afraid um, uh, to be seen out and, and so on. Well, that may well be so. Um, afraid to be seen going to speak to Jesus. There was a price already on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, he goes at night perhaps because of that reason. But this gospel is a spiritual gospel. And we are told that Jesus is the light of the world. And Nicodemus goes at night because he's in the darkness. It's the darkness that he's in is a reflection of the darkness in his soul. And I'm sure that is the real understanding that we're meant to have of this passage. This man is in the dark. It's interesting, isn't it, that when, um, when Judas goes out to betray the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told, and it was night. Well, of course it was night. It, it, it's a supper. When do you have suppers? It, you have suppers at night time. And it's simply telling us Judas is going out into the dark. The, the darkness is in him. And here is this man. He's in the dark. Well, he does the right thing, doesn't he? He has a problem, a spiritual problem, and he does the right thing. He goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great lesson for us. Great lesson for all of us. You've got a problem, you've got a difficulty, you've got questions, take it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the man who is in the dark 
goes to the man who is the light. He goes seeking light from his darkness. <coughs> Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God because no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. That's the conundrum. Clearly Jesus is speaking in a certain way and teaching in a certain way and behaving and performing miracles and signs in a certain way and he can't square that he, he can't square it all up. His life and his teaching is completely different from that of the Lord Jesus Christ's. No one can do the sign that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. And uh, we time to go into that in one sense but basically um, Nicodemus knows what that means it means that he's got to start again it means that he has to put everything that, that he's, he, he has become away and he's got to start again he's got to begin again and so he, he, he can't believe that Jesus really means that I've got to throw this life away and I've got to start again and so Nicodemus pretends to be stupid and he, say, and he starts talking about entering his mother's womb again. And Jesus says, look, we're talking about the spirit here. The spirit, you, you've not understood these things. You've not able to cope with these things because the spirit has not illuminated your mind. The, not, the light isn't in your mind as yet. And Jesus says, look, let, let me take you to something that you will understand. And so he takes him back to the Old Testament. He takes him back to that place that we've just read before, to Numbers and 21. And here are the people who are under judgment. And they have sinned. And they must go to that serpent and look and live. And Jesus says that just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so must I, the Son of Man, be lifted up. So that everyone who believes in me may not perish but have eternal life. <coughs> Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, I must become like that foul, horrible, dirty, unclean serpent. Here is Jesus, the best man who's ever lived, and he's saying, I must become like the worst man who ever died. I've got to become like that serpent, foul, repugnant, repellent, unclean. And only when he's become foul and repellent and unclean can we look to him and live. And that's what he's saying to Nicodemus. That's, Nicodemus, that is what you must do. As Moses lifted up the serpent, in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life and so the offer that was given by Moses to the people in the Old Testament is exactly the same it's as the offer that the Lord Jesus Christ is giving to Nicodemus and to everyone else in the world the offer is exactly the same he's saying Nicodemus I must be lifted up I'm going to be crucified. And Nicodemus knew what that phrase meant. And when I'm crucified, I will become like that foul, wicked, evil serpent, repugnant, repellent. And you must look to me and live. And so you see, the same is, is exactly the same in one sense, isn't it? It is believe and look and live. But now Jesus is saying, we're not being saved from the bite of the physical serpent, but we're being... We're being bitten by our own sinfulness, the death that comes to us through our sinfulness. And so we look now not at a serpent, but at a saviour. And we believe in him as the only remedy, as the only cure for our sin and the certainty of eternal life. And that is the offer that is made, um, that is the offer that is made to Nicodemus and to us. And as far as we know, that's pretty much the end of the conversation. Nicodemus goes away. But then the Saviour is crucified. He is lifted up. 
and he does die upon the cross bearing shame and scoffing rude in our place condemned he stood sealed our pardon with his blood hallelujah what a saviour and Nicodemus goes to the cross isn't it amazing that he goes with Joseph of Arimathea and he goes there to the cross why is it that the man who was in the dark travelling around it, it, seeing Jesus in the dark and at night is now prepared to go in full in, in full public glare and align himself with the Saviour well quite simply because the Saviour has died upon the cross the picture that we have that, that was given to him in Numbers 21 and the explanation of it that the Lord gave to him in what we have as John chapter 3 has been fulfilled Nicodemus now sees that the Saviour has been lifted up and he's understood the connection. He's seen that the Saviour is, is bearing shame and scoffing rude. And so he goes, and with that gentleness and tenderness that, the, that these two men, they take the body down from the cross, and they wrap it, uh, and they, they lay it in the tomb. Nicodemus was prepared to act and believe on that basis. But that's all he knew. That's all he knew. He knew that the Saviour had died and that he could believe and trust in the Saviour. What he didn't know that was within three days the Saviour would, would be raised from the dead and that the, uh, the, 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 the treatment that was given to him wrapping him in those uh, cloths and, uh, 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 and wrapping into those cloths, those spices that none of that would be needed that once again the tomb would be empty. And I just, I just wonder when Nicodemus woke up that first Lord's Day morning, that first Sunday morning, and the news starts to filter through. You can imagine the, the joy, the excitement, the, the thrill that, has, that would fill his mind and fill his heart. It's even better than he believed. It's not just that the Saviour has died, but the Saviour's been raised again. He's alive. Once again he is speaking and teaching. Once again he is performing his miracles. What a wonderful experience that must be for Nicodemus. And so we have a saviour that has come into this world and taken our flesh. He has um, lived the life that we could not live. And he's died the death that we would not dare to die. But it doesn't end there. The saviour has been raised again from the dead and that is the journey that he will take us on we are traveling um, from the slavery of our sin in Egypt as it were we're traveling through the wilderness of this world and we're heading to the promised land and we follow the way and direction that the Savior <coughs> has gone in and so our Savior uh, has been raised again and uh, he is now ascended and in heaven but again, that is not the end. And it's here that we come uh, to our harvest theme. So here uh, in, in, um, in Acts 17, we read that the Saviour, yes, has lived and died and has been raised again. He has ascended into heaven. But that is not the end. He is going to return once more to this world. And here is Paul preaching then um, uh, in... Uh, in the in act 17 and he says that the times of ignorance god has overlooked there were time when we didn't know anything about the, the god and about salvation we didn't know anything about these things and and that ignorance god is prepared to to overlook but now there is a command has gone forth and the command is this that we would uh, that we would look at, and believe in the savior he commands uh, all men everywhere to repent to turn from their sins and to trust in the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And why? Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given us assurance to all men. What? By raising him from the dead. And so... What we're seeing here now is the Lord Jesus Christ who has been raised from the dead will be the judge of this world. 
Remember how we, we began our service this morning. We began by listening to John the Baptist telling us um, that this wonderful one who is coming, whose sandals he was not even worthy uh, to, to, uh, 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 to take off his feet, uh, will come in judgment. He will come, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he's going to sift the wheat from the chaff, and the, the wrath of God will be upon those who, who do not believe, and the joy and the, the delight of, and security of salvation will be upon those who do. And so, we come this harvest morning uh, to remember these things, that we have a Saviour who one day will return, a Saviour who one day will come in the might and power of his holy angels. Every eye will see him. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ will return, and he will cause the whole of human, humanity to stand before him. Everyone who has ever lived will be there. Every man, woman and child will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they stand before him, everyone will, um, will, will speak his praise and his glory. One saviour, two groups of people because he will separate the sheep from the goats. He will separate the wheat from the chaff. He will separate the saved from the lost. Now, everyone will give this one uh, testifying word that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. I'm thinking now Philippians chapter 2. So there's that one statement with, with two people but two very different emotions. One statement, two emotions. With the one group of people it, it is wrung from them. They will have to acknowledge that re, he truly is Lord to the glory of the Father. And they will hate every sentence of, of uh, every word of that sentence. And they will still hate him and still loathe him. They will be grinding and gnashing their teeth against him. But they will have to speak those words to the praise and the glory of the Father. He is Lord to the glory of the Father. What a terrible, wicked and evil emotion. And that will be theirs for eternity. But then there is another emotion. And it is the emotion of those who have been longing and waiting for the Saviour's return. Some were already, were still upon the earth when he returned. Others have already gone before, gone to glory. And all are brought together. And they stand then before the Saviour. And they proclaim that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. And their hearts rejoice in it. Their minds and their souls are one with those words. They are delighting in those words, in those thoughts, the emotions that it brings to them. So, one phrase, two people, two emotions. The Lord Jesus Christ has been raised, first of all, up on that pole on the cross now he has been raised up from the dead then he has been raised up to the very heaven itself and one day he will be caused to return as it stands at this moment which side of the divide are you on I look across the congregation I Basically, I see you as a believing congregation. So it's all, you're all on one side, as far as I know. But are you? Please do make sure that you know that you belong to the Saviour. Make sure, that, absolutely sure, that you are trusting in him and in nothing else. A dear friend of ours, we have spent so many times over the years talking to her about the gospel. And the conversation has often been something like, you know, we really we, we have to trust the Lord entirely for our salvation. Yes, I know, but we have to do the best we can, don't we? Uh, and then you say, well, no, 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 we, we have to, we, we, we look to the Lord alone to, to, and trust in him alone for our salvation. Yes, and we have to be good people as best we can. And so it goes on. They always wanted to add something to it. So I ask you this, this morning, dear friends, are you sure that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Have you seen him raised up as that foul, disgusting, um, repugnant thing on the cross? Have you seen him there? And have you known that the reason he's there is, is, is because your sin is there? That's what's repugnant. That's what is awful. That's what's dreadful. It is your sin that is there upon him. He's become sin for your sake. The best man who ever lived has become the worst man who ever died. He didn't become a sinful man on the cross. The Bible says he became sin who knew no sin. He's become indistinguishable. There was nothing nice or, or pleasant about that serpent that Moses put on the pole. Nothing at all. And there's nothing nice or pleasant about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is totally, uh, he is totally sin on the cross. But why is he there? He is there because it is your sin, our sin, yours and mine on the cross putting him there. And we look to that and we believe. He has taken my sin away. And if my, if my sin has been taken away, then God has nothing against me. I am acceptable and accepted in the beloved. So again I say to you, the day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to this world. He will return as the farmer comes to his harvest. He will reap a harvest of souls. And he will divide and separate the whole of humanity into two and only two groups. The saved and the lost. The wheat and the chaff. And again, as I say, what a joy to know that you belong uh, to the Saviour by faith. Dear friends, that's our gospel message. It is the, the message of harvest. The harvest has been slowly coming about, hasn't it? it, it the fruit has ripened it has come to to fullness and then there's the harvest and it's all put to one side uh, and it's a wonderful thought but there's also that that, that, that there's the chaff that the, there's the junk and the muck and all of that's cleared away and so this morning um, all I must do is again commend the Savior to you and ask you um, to love him uh, and to make sure that you are truly a repentant person person before him and then you know that when he comes we don't know when that is when he comes and returns you know that the that the words that you will speak that he is lord to the glory of the father will glorify the father but it will have a wonderful warm echo in your own soul as those words are spoken well the lord bless you in these things amen